Vasudevan. They will talk about chapter one in international finance. So this gives you an introduction to the course. Okay? So what are some of the things we want to talk about? We'll talk about the goal of the financial corporation. We'll also talk about the structure of the multinational corporation. Okay? We'll talk about the key theories that justify international business. So what are some of the reasons why companies want to do business in other countries? About common methods used to conduct international business. And finally, we'll talk about a model for valuing the multinational corporation. So these are the main uh, things we want to talk about as far as chapter one is concerned. So chapter one is primarily a descriptive chapter. Okay. And here, what we are saying is that when you look at a firm, okay, what we find is that firms do business usually in different ways. Okay, the first one is you have a multinational firm, and what it might do is that it might deal in the product markets. So as an example, Apple will sell their iPhones, they sell their iPads, they sell their iPods all over the world. They might sell it in Europe, they might sell it in Asia, China, India, they might also sell it in South America. So here, we're talking about the product markets, so how a US multinational deals in the product markets. Now, when they sell their products abroad, one of the things is that they get paid in foreign currency. So they might be getting paid in Chinese Yuan, they might be getting paid in Euros, they might be getting paid in Indian Rupees, and so on. And all this money, they have to bring it back to the US in the form of a dividend or in the form of a repatriation. And what you see here is that when they do that, they have to convert their in the foreign exchange market. So that's one example of a transaction by a U.S. multinational. The second example is that they might also have subsidiaries in other countries. So if you look at most uh, software companies based in the U.S., such as Microsoft, such as Oracle, or such as Google, and so on, chances are they all have operations in India, and they have subsidiaries in India. That's one example. If you look at a company like GM, they have subsidiaries in China to manufacture cars. And if you look at a company like Mercedes-Benz, or if you look at BMW, or if you look at Audi, most of them have manufacturing facilities in the U.S. So they have subsidiaries in the U.S. So again, when they have subsidiaries in the U.S., they have to worry about financing those subsidiaries. They also have to worry about converting their profits made by the subsidiaries back to the parent company. So when they do that, again, they have to go to the foreign exchange market. Now, what is the third example of a multinational company engaging in the foreign exchange markets? That is when they try to raise money for investment. So as an example, one of the biggest uh, initial public offerings that we had in 2014, that was the $10 billion initial public offering of Alibaba. So Alibaba is a Chinese company, and they basically sold their stock as part of an IPO all over the world. So in this case, we are talking about investing and we are talking about financing especially. So for Alibaba, that was a financing decision. How do they raise money for their business? And they did it through an IPO and the IPO was conducted pretty much all over the world. Okay? So in this case, again, the money they get as part of the financing, they might have to convert it back into their home currency and to do that, they have to engage in the financial markets, okay, in the foreign exchange markets. Now, we want to talk about the management structure of multinational corporations. So here, we are talking about the way in which they set up their operations and the different styles of operation. So the first one is a centralized operation, and the second one is a decentralized operation. So from the previous course you took in finance, uh, what we see here is that what are the main financial functions of a corporation? And they tend to be, one is the cash management. So what is the cash management? We are talking about current accounts, we are talking about uh, 
current liabilities, and we are talking about short-term financing. We are also talking about accounts payable, accounts receivable, and so on. So that typically are, uh, usually we refer to that as working capital management. And in this case, what we see is that for this company, it has two subsidiaries, A and B, and for all those activities, as far as working capital is concerned, all the activities had to be controlled by the parent company. So the cash management process or the working capital of the subsidiaries, they don't have much independence. They have to report all those activities to the parent company. Okay? So that's what we see here, the cash management, we have the inventory and accounts receivable management. So typically together they are referred to as the working capital management. The next one is the financing decision. So how do they raise the money? And here again, what we see is whether it's financing at subsidiary A or financing at subsidiary B, all those decisions are again centralized and they have to be done through the parent company. Okay? And the next one is we have the investment decision, which is a capital expenditure decision. And for both uh, the subsidiaries, A and B, all the decisions they make have again to be okayed by the parent company or they have to be approved by the parent company. So what we see here is that the management style is very centralized. All the uh, key decisions are being made by the parent company or ultimately they have to be approved by the parent company. So that is a very centralized style. The next one you see here is that we have a more decentralized type of management. And in this case, we talked about the cash management, we had talked about the inventory and accounts receivable management, and we talked about the financing decision, we also talked about the investment decision. So that would be the capital expenditures at A, the financing at A, and then we had the cash management at A, and the inventory and accounts receivable management at subsidiary A. So what we see here is that all those decisions are independently done by each of the subsidiaries. So all the managers at subsidiary A make those, make those decisions for subsidiary B. So here, this is a completely decentralized management. So what might you see in practice? Usually what you might see in practice is somewhere in, in between these two. It may not be completely centralized, but it may not also be completely decentralized. So as an example, when you talk about the investment decision, what the parent company might say is that decisions of up to 10 million can be made by the subsidiary. After that, they have to be approved by the parent company. So this way, the subsidiaries have a certain level of independence, but at the same time, the parent company still has control and the parent company is able to manage the overall risk. Okay. Now we want to talk about the agency problems of a multinational corporation. Now in the previous course you took in corporate finance, usually in chapter one, we talk about the agency problems. So what are, what is the agency problem? So here we are talking about the conflict of goals between the managers and the shareholders. So typically when you look at a company, the shareholders of the company, they are supposed to be the owners of the company. And if you are an owner of the company, your primary goal is to increase the firm value or you want to make sure that the managers do all that they can to increase the share price. On the other hand, if you are a manager, so forget the manager, let's think about you. Let's say you get your first job and you finish the interview. Once you have a choice between different jobs, what are some of the things that you might look for? So you might want to figure out what is your pay, okay, so how much money you can make, how much is your bonus going to be on average, how much do you get in the form of stock compensation. You also want to look at your health care benefits, your retirement benefits, and so on. So typically what you find is that when you get your first job or when you are working in a company, you are very concerned about what you can get as part of your employment. And typically what the employer is looking for is what they can get out of you. So there is typically a difference in the opinion between the employer and the uh, employee. So that is an example of the agency problem. So how can you reduce the agency problem? The first is parent control of agency problem. 
So one example I can think about recently is Yahoo and Alibaba. So Alibaba is a company based in China. They are a very big company, and we just talked about their IPO of $10 billion in 2014. Now, in this case, Yahoo owns a substantial part of Alibaba. So as far as Yahoo shareholders are concerned, one of the best investments they ever made was buying a, a, a big piece of Alibaba before it became so big. And if you look at Yahoo, most of the value comes from their investment made in Alibaba. And what was the issue they faced? So some time back, the CEO of Alibaba, uh, his name is Jack Ma, they used to have a subsidiary called Alipay. So Alipay is something like PayPal in the US. And what the CEO did was, he basically sold the company, which is a subsidiary, to himself. And he did not receive the full approval of the parent company, and that was Yahoo. So Yahoo was a significant shareholder in Alibaba. So there was a conflict between uh, the Yahoo, the CEO, and the uh, Jack Ma, who was the CEO of Alibaba. Now ultimately what happened was Alibaba's CEO was quite powerful and in the end the CEO of Yahoo had to resign. They hired a new CEO and the new CEO conducted more talks with Alibaba and finally they came to a settlement. But here what we see is an extreme case of the agency problem where the CEO of a company that is very closely related is basically selling a part of the company to himself. So there, that is one example of the agency problem. And what is the second case? How can we reduce the agency problem, maximize the parent value, not the subsidiary? So what we are saying here is that, in this case, for the subsidiary, especially the top managers, we want to make sure that they do the things that will enhance the value of the parent company and not just the subsidiary. How can we do that? One of the ways you can do that is to make sure that as far as their compensation is concerned, we want to pay them partly with the stock of the parent company. So let's say you are Ford, you are the parent company, you have a subsidiary in India. In this case, you want to make sure that the CEO and the top managers of the Indian subsidiary do all that they can to increase the value of Ford. And to do that, one of the ways is to make sure that part of the pay paycheck comes in the form of shares of the parent company. Okay? And what else is there? Compensation plans, Apple and Cook is one example. So when Cook became the CEO of Apple, he received approximately $400 million in stock and stock options. And what is the reason why he gets paid in stock and stock options? If you just give him $400 million in cash, he does not have much incentive to increase the value of Apple. But if he gets paid in stock and stock options, you know that he will do the right things to increase the value of Apple. Because by increasing the value of Apple, he's also increasing his own paycheck. Okay? So that these are some examples of how you can reduce the agency problem. Now, what else can you do to bring down the agency problem? The first is, outsiders can buy the firm at depressed prices. So what we are saying here is that if the managers are not doing a good job, chances are the price of the stock will go down. And this because happens because overall the earnings of the company might have gone down over time. So in this case, whenever uh, people from outside, so especially large investors such as hedge funds and other money managers, they find this as a good opportunity to buy the stock of the firm at these relatively low prices. And chances are they will put pressure on the management to do a better job. And what are some examples of such investors? We have hedge funds, we have mutual funds, such as TIA Craft and such as CalPERS, that is the California Pension Fund, they tend to be very activist investors. They typically try to push the firms to do the right things. Okay. Now, what else was uh, something that took place in recent times that has made changes in the firm? And this was the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. 
So what we see is that we had a lot of uh, problems with some of the major U.S. corporations such as en Enron, such as MCI, WorldCom, and the problems mainly came because the CEOs of those firms were not doing the right thing and sometimes they were even lying to their investors. So to, do, uh, to get around these problems, uh, the Congress came up with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 and what it does is that it requires firms to implement an internal reporting process that can be easily monitored by the executives. It also makes the executives more accountable for financial statements by personally verifying their accuracy. So the main thing here is that when the CEO signs, signs their annual report and signs other financial statements, they can be personally responsible. So if some of the facts there are not true, there's a good chance they can be taken to court and there has been an even some cases where CEOs ultimately ended up in jail because of their misdeeds. And here, so that is a good thing as far as reporting is concerned, that can increase the accounting transparency of the US-based firms. Now what is the bad part? The bad part is that what we find is that in recent times, some of the firms that typically grow up and do an IPO, they decided in recent times not to do that. And the main reason why they decided not to do that was because they did not want to meet the higher reporting requirements and the higher expenses that they would have to incur if they do an IPO, sell the stock to the public, and are listed in the stock exchange. So rather than do that, they decided to be taken over by another company, usually a larger company. And again, what we see is that some, we also have some cases where some of the foreign firms that would have listed in the U.S., they decided not to be listed in the U.S., mainly because they did not want to be, meet the higher requ reporting requirements of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Okay? Now, the third topic we want to cover in Chapter 1 is we want to talk about some of the reasons why companies go abroad. So what are some of the reasons why companies go abroad? So the first one is we want to talk about the theory of competitive advantage. So what is the theory of competitive advantage? So what we are saying here is that different countries can do different things well. And in this case, what we are saying is that the country that does something best, they want to focus on that and leave the rest to other companies which perhaps can do a better job of the process. So what are some examples? One example would be Apple. Another example would be Hasbro. So in both these cases, these companies are US-based companies. And what we see is that in the US, there is a lot of emphasis on innovation. So innovation basically means that in the case of design, coming up with new products, what we find is that a lot of the new products, especially the innovations, came from the US. So we have companies like Microsoft, we have companies like Google, that could be a Facebook. So all these are some of the recent innovative examples. And the reason why they came from here is mainly because even at a very young age, there is emphasis on innovation. So design is very good in the US, and coming up with new products is also very good in the US. But at the same time, what we find is that typically manufacturing costs tend to be much higher in the US, partly because of the higher environmental standards, higher health costs, and so on. So usually what we find is that companies like Apple and Hasbro, they do most of the design in the US, and when it comes to manufacturing, they send it abroad, especially to China. And what we find is that in China, in the same factory, they make the different types of smartphones. So they do manufacturing for the HTC phone, they do manufacturing for the iPhone and so on. And the reason being that overall the labor costs are later, uh, lower and manufacturing is more competitive in China. Okay, that's one example. What are some of the other examples? If you look at Volkswagen or if you look at a Mercedes-Benz, Germany is very well known for their engineering. So again, what these companies try to do is that they do their engineering design in Germany and when it comes to manufacturing, Manufacturing, they typically take it abroad to lower cost country. So if you look at Volkswagen, they sell a lot of their cars in the US and most of the manufacturing for those cars is done in Mexico. 
which is close by, they can manufacture it there and then bring it to the US. That's one example. If you look at Sony, again Sony is, Japan is very well known for their engineering, especially their engineering design. And what companies like Sony do is that they do their engineering design in Japan and when it comes to manufacturing, they take it abroad to lower cost countries. So there, this talks about the theory of competitive advantage and in this case we are saying that some countries are good at doing certain things and we want to focus on those activities and the rest of the activities we want to take it to other countries which might be perhaps be able to do a better job at a lower cost. Now the second is, second reason why companies go abroad is because of imperfect markets. So what are imperfect markets? Basically what we are saying here is that factors of production are somewhat immobile providing incentive to seek out foreign opportunities. What are some of the other examples? Barriers to entry and restrictions on transferring funds. So one example is uh, if you look at a company like Mercedes-Benz, so one of the products that you see all over the US is their Mercedes-Benz Sprinter vans. And these are large trucks that are used by FedEx, that are used by UPS, and a lot of other companies. And why do these companies do that? Because Mercedes is well known for their quality, and it's a pretty big, relatively modern vehicle that is not very expensive, especially when you look at the cost and benefits. Now, what Mercedes does is that they do the manufacturing in Germany, and then they export it to the US. Now, one of the things is that when they export to the US, especially if they bring it as a complete vehicle, they have to pay very high taxes. So to get around that, what Mercedes does is that they make it in Germany, they take it to the port, and then they partially dismantle the vehicle. So they take out the seats and so on, so that it's not a finished product. They ship it to the US, and once it reaches the US ports, they again put back the seats and complete the vehicle. So what we see here is that they have a barrier to entry or there is a restriction on free imports. And to get around that, Mercedes is doing what we talked about now. Now what happened last week is that because their vehicles are so popular in the US, Mercedes-Benz is now planning to manufacture those vehicles in the US. And again, what we are seeing here is that uh, it's uh, manufacturing them in Germany and then selling them to the US is not very cost effective and for Mercedes-Benz, especially because manufacturing costs are lower in the US, it makes sense for them to make a $500 million investment and start producing these vehicles in the US. The third one is we talk about the product cycle theory and what we are saying here is that as a firm matures, it recognizes opportunities outside the domestic market. So what are some examples of this, the product cycle theory? Some of the examples are if you look at a company like Whirlpool or if you look at a GE, GE they are in the business of making washing machines drying dryers, dishwashers, and a lot of products, refrigerators, and so on for the home. Now in the US, these products have been out there for I think maybe 60 to 70 years. So every home has a fridge, chances are they might have an AC, they definitely have an electric oven or a gas oven and so on. So the market in the US has become pretty saturated. But at the same time, if you go to Asia, if you go to China, or if you go to India, these countries have become wealthy in recent years and there is a very high, large, growing middle class. And this middle class is looking forward to having these products in their house. So they want to have washing machines, they want to have refrigerators, they want to have cooktops and so on. So that's one of the reasons why you find companies like Whirlpool and GE going to countries like India, like China, like Brazil and so on, so that they have a bigger market for their products. So that is the product cycle theory. So what do you see? Look at the product cycle theory. Basically what we see here is that firms create the product 
for their local market. So initially, they want to sell their dishwashers or the ovens and so on in the US, and then firm exports the product to accommodate the foreign demand. So when they see that there is demand for these products in China or Brazil or India, initially they export their products to the foreign market. Once the market, they know that there's going to be a good demand, the firm establishes foreign subsidiary to establish the presence in the foreign country and possibly to reduce cost. So we talked about the Mercedes Center, that's what they did. They initially exported and now they want to do the manufacturing in the US. Okay? Now, what is the problem here? So initially, when you look at a GM or when you look at a G product, one of the reasons why people bought that was because that was a foreign company and there they are well known for their quality. But if Mercedes makes the same product in the US, chances are people realize that this is a US product and the halo that they had because they are a German company that's going to go down. So there, it becomes a little more difficult for, let's say, Mercedes-Benz to differentiate this printer from other products that are out in the market. Let's say Ford has a similar type of vehicle. So that's what we see in the case of the international product life cycle. But I think, you know, when you look at the international product cycle theory, or when you talk about the product cycle theory, I think in recent times, it has become less important. And the main reason why it has become less important is because of the web, the World Wide Web. So what we see is that when iPhone, when, when the Apple comes up with a new phone, let's say the iPhone 6, chances are people in China or people in India or people in Europe already know about that. All of them can go to the website of Apple and they can get all the information they need about this new product. Which means that if Apple tries to sell the older version, let's say the iPhone 5 or some of the previous model, chances are people are not willing to buy that product. So what we see here, where a company first matures and then it moves to new markets, I think that life cycle has become much shorter or almost eliminated because of the World Wide Web and because information of pretty much every product is all over the world. Okay. Now what we want to do is, the next thing is we want to talk about the different ways in which firms do international business. Okay. So the simplest way and the easiest way is through international trade, so conservative and low cost. So as an example, if you look at Walmart, so in the US, the Walmart is known for their low prices, that is what they always advertise, and one of the reasons why they have such low prices is because they import a lot of their products from China. So there, Walmart primarily engaged in international trade. So in recent times, they have also expanded to Mexico and so on. They have uh, stores in other countries, but primarily they operate in the US, and what we see is that their primary mode of business is to import from lower cost countries and then sell their products in the US, okay? So that is a lower cost way, a low cost approach. It's also a very conservative approach. Why do we say that it's a conservative and low cost approach? The main reason being that they're not investing to start a new business. They are primarily uh, connecting with manufacturers in other countries and importing it. So here, the setup costs are lower, but at the same time, shipping costs will be higher, simply because they have to ship the product over very long distances. Okay. What is the next step? The next step for a firm usually is licensing, and especially you might see this in the case of pharmaceuticals. You might also see that in the case of software products. So there, what is the benefit here? It allows firms to use the technology in foreign countries without major investment. So what we find is that a lot of the US pharmaceutical companies, they have tie-ups with companies, other pharmaceutical companies in other countries. Again, that could be 
in Brazil, that could be in Mexico, that could be in China, that could be in India, and so on. Now the reason why they do that is because they already have this new product, they have patents, they have licenses, which give them the exclusive right for a certain time period. And here, they don't want to op set up operations in a foreign country. Rather than do that, they want to give the license to the, another company and basically get some royalties from the foreign company. Okay? That's what we see there as the licensing. What is the third way you can do business? The third way is you can do franchising. So here, what happens is that the US-based firm provides sales service support in exchange for fees. So what we are saying here is that, in this case, if you look at a Subway, if you look at a McDonald's, you might see them all over the world. You can see them in Russia, you can see them in China, you can see them in Europe, and so on. And here, the parent company, that is a multinational company based in the US, is providing franchises with support. And that could be sales support, service support, as well as product support. And for this, the parent company gets a certain percentage of their revenues. They also might get a certain percentage of, the, of their profits in the form of royalties. Okay? Now, what is the fourth example of how a firm engages in international business? That would be through joint ventures. So some examples are Walmart operates in India, uh, GM operates in China, Ford operates in Brazil, and so on. Typically, they do that through joint ventures. So let's say that GM does operations in China. The Chinese government does not allow GM to op operate their business independently. So the Chinese government, basically what they say is that they should have a local partner, and the local partner should have a certain amount of ownership in the subsidiary. The Chinese government also says that the GM has to share the technology with their Chinese partner. So there is a risk for GM, and the risk for GM is that the Chinese partner can take the product, the technology, and they might come up with their own products based upon this uh, technology. So that is a risk that they face, and that is what we see in the case of a joint venture. And what we see here is that a lot of the time, joint ventures are a must because of the rules and regulations of different countries. Okay? What is the way a company can go abroad? That would be acquisitions of existing operations. So in this case, why do companies do that? The main reason why companies do that is because by acquiring a foreign company, they will have more control over quality, they will have more control over operations, and perhaps they can get a bigger market share. So what are some examples? Honda, when they st made, started making uh, scooters and motorbikes in India, initially they had a local partner, but as part of their contract, they also had the right to buy out their local partner. So after a few years, what Honda did was they bought out their local partner and they became Honda India. Okay. So there, the reason why they did that was because they wanted to have more control over the operations. And the last one is establishing new foreign subsidiaries. So one example I have here is Citicorp. So what you see is that in the case of banks, they can have Citicorp Europe, they will have Citicorp Asia, and so on. And the main reason why they do that is because the banking laws of different countries tend to be different. And if the subsidiary in China or the subsidiary in India tends to follow the laws of the US, they are not going to be very competitive. So that's the main reason why when they go abroad, they tend to establish a foreign subsidiary. So what we see here is that when you talk about how firms engage in international business, what you might find is that the way they do that is initially through international trade, and then they might do a franchising, they might do a joint venture, and this is what you might see most of the time. And after some time, when they get confident, they will try to stop it. Thank you.